Hi, everyone. I'm super, like my favorite thing in the world to do is come to events like these and see all of these amazing kick-ass women and our allies in this room because it's so important. And today we have the most amazing panel of women. Our, our call in preparation for this, I think could have gone on like two hours um, if we didn't have day jobs. And I'm really excited to share all of their experiences with you. So if my panelists can come join me, I don't know where you all are. All right, so here we have Karen and Lisa and Coco and Oriana. Um, welcome them all to the stage, please. So, um, so in the spirit of every woman should own her own story, we decided that they're each going to have a minute to introduce themselves. So Karen, let's start out with you. Who are you, Karen? Good morning, everyone. I'm Karen Sugihara. I am the Senior Regional Fiduciary Manager with Wells Fargo Bank here in San Francisco. I am a recovering attorney by background, uh, practiced trust and estate planning law for 20 years before joining Wells Fargo five years ago. Um, I recently relocated from Los Angeles up to the Bay Area, um, so to take on my new position here. I lead a team of um, trust professionals, fiduciary professionals here in San Francisco. I have the honor and, and the privilege of managing the largest trust department of any bank in the country with uh, just over 12 billion in uh, trust assets on our platform. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Hey, right, Coco Brown. Yeah, so uh, I'm Coco Brown. I'm the founder and CEO of an organization called the Athena Alliance uh, that I started two and a half years ago and couldn't uh, do a better job at echoing what Mina said about, you know, start small with just an idea and you don't have any idea where it's going to go, but my organization has really taken off. We've become the um, premier executive development program for top female leaders looking to advance in senior leadership and into the boardroom. Whether you choose to join an outside board or uh, just become the bench strength of your own organization, wanting to present to your own board and become an officer of the company, the best thing you can do for yourself in senior leadership is become board confident, board savvy, and board connected. We do that work and, and our reputation has grown and so we've also been supporting uh, boards as they look for women directors, over 130 now. And my first uh, public company, California headquartered, without a, f a female on the board, called me yesterday. <laughs> so, that was great. And I, um, I used to refer to myself as a recovering Silicon Valley exec. I moved out here 20 some, 27 years ago after college and, um, and ran a tech company for a number of years, uh, not realizing how rare I was. Um, and had had it at a certain point. We can talk about that at some point and thought I was out, but then here I am again. <laughs> Thank goodness. All right, Oriana. Hey everyone, I'm super excited to be here with my panelists. Um, Oriana Brannon, Director of Community and Public Relations for Alaska Airlines in the Bay Area. And I handle our community investment um, right here in the Bay for diversity and inclusion, sustainability, and youth and education, and also lead our external communications. Um, I view myself as a communicator at heart. I've always loved communications, and I think I fell in love at the age of eight when I won a, a national poem contest for a haiku I wrote about uh, fluffy white clouds. Um, <laughs> and Do you remember I, this haiku? Um, I just remember the emphasis was on fluffy white clouds. <laughs> but I've, I've taken that love of writing and that love of communication and funneled it um, personally and professionally. So personally, I write on the side about my trials and tribulations being a young mother um, to two young daughters, ages one and a half and four. And I've been published in Scary Mommy and Huffington Post, <laughs> among others. Um, and also in my free time, I sit on the board of directors for the San Francisco Chamber, uh, Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley, my people right there, and the Public Relations Society of America, the Silicon Valley chapter. Um, and additionally, I was honored this year for my work at Alaska by being named to PR Week's 40 Under 40 list. Wonderful. Congratulations. All right. Lisa. 
Um, hi, I'm Lisa Abramson, and I'm um, a mindfulness teacher and executive coach and an author. I wrote a book called The Wise Mama Guide to Maternity Leave, and I wrote that um, about my experience uh, transitioning into motherhood on the theme of being a recovering something. I'd say I'm a recovering perfectionist, still working <laughs> on that. Uh, but. Um, yeah, wrote this book about um, being kind of an overachieving type A woman and how different it is to kind of rise up in your career and then find yourself on a maternity leave, um, long days at home with a baby and what that was like for me. Um, and I've done some advocacy work and given a TEDx talk about my transition into motherhood. And I got, I was running marketing at a tech startup before um, becoming an executive coach and mindfulness teacher because I basically burnt out and ha thought to myself there has to be a better way and through all the tools that I found out myself I realized I wanted to give these back uh, to women to help them really find some sustainable success and not sacrifice their well-being. Start with um, a blog post that Oriana you wrote for Scary Mommy, which is if anybody doesn't follow Scary Mommy on Instagram, it is my favorite thing in the world. If you are thinking about kids and you haven't decided yet, maybe you don't <laughs> follow Scary Mommy because <laughs> because you'll probably be just fine. Um, but you wrote a, this, a blog post that was entitled "Why Having It All Is Scary AF." And, um, which I just love that that's even a thing we can say on a stage now. <laughs> so, I, my question for each of you that I thought we would kick it off with was, is what does having it all mean to you? And um, is it the same thing as when you were starting out in your career? So, Oriana, you are our byline on this blog post, so you start. Ultimately, I know that my daughters see me, they're proud of me, will you know, drive by on the freeway and see an Alaska Airlines billboard and they'll shout out, Mama, that's your company. <laughs> or um, my daughter, who is a huge Kevin Durant fan, and we ha have a partnership with him through Alaska Airlines, she'll run into her classroom at preschool and say, my mama hung out with Kevin Durant this week, what did your mama do? <laughs> and so I know through those stories that they see me, they see who I am, not just in the home, but outside of it. Um, research shows that children of working mothers are ultimately more successful, and I think it's really important for our daughters to see that. Statistics show that girls of working mothers actually make 23% higher salary than uh, daughters of non-working mothers, and boys of working mothers <coughs> go on to have more of a hand in um, family and household and rearing children. So I think those statistics very, very clearly show for us that there is benefit to have that working mom and we just need to, we need to be easier on ourselves. We need to give each other space to recognize that we're just doing the best that we can. So Lisa, you advise women, career women, when they're even pregnant about yeah. how, to, how to manage this before the baby even comes. What does having it all mean to you and what do you tell your clients about it? Yeah, I think what's most important here is to find your definition of success and connect with your values because it's gonna look different for um, each one of us and I find that we can get stuck in that comparison trap and looking for other people for answers or how do they do it and the truth is for your own path if it's your true path you won't see it clearly marked ahead of you um, if, it, if you can see it it's someone else's path they've already done what you're trying to do so you need to kind of learn to sit a little bit in the unknown and start to craft your own vision of success um, in your head and then move towards there. So I think kind of getting that personal connection and not just looking outside of yourself. Karen, do you have a different idea of what, what does having it all mean to you? Well, I found that always be open to accepting um, you know, new opportunities <laughs> and challenges. Um, I found myself a few years ago um, in a position where my marriage of over 18 years was coming to an end um, and I had to reinvent myself. I realized that as a single parent without um, you know, a, um, a father who was going to be supportive of his children, I was going to have to uh, reinvent myself and look to a different alternative career path because certainly trying to have a work-life balance 
while working in a law firm and being subject to a billable hour requirement, that wasn't going to be doable anymore. And luckily, I looked to the financial services industry and found a very supportive environment within Wells where we really do stress having a work-life balance and I wasn't subject to a restrictive billable hour requirement anymore. Um, so I would say always be open to looking at new opportunities, think creatively because you just never know where your path and your journey may lead you to. Now, Coco, you deal with a ton of women in really high levels of leadership. So you have a broad perspective on this. What, what do you see across all that? What, does, it, does it differ from women to women? Woman to woman? Yeah, I, I would say that um, I agree with my peers on, on stage here that um, it, it is, it's most important to realize that it's very personal. That having for a couple of things. One, having it all doesn't mean doing it all. And I think as we as we as we make our lives bigger and bigger and bigger, whether it's because we're taking on bigger jobs or now we've got a family or we've got an extended family, whatever it is that we're doing to make our lives bigger and bigger and bigger over time, um, sort of leaves us in a position where we're we're constantly trying to do it all to have it all. And what I see in talking to to women um, broadly and individually is that we're all just getting really creative in the moment. <laughs> you know, um, I I was telling this story I. I've been, I had no idea that I would be traveling so much. When I was running uh, my former company, because I was the, the head of the company, I could set all the rules, right? I'm never gonna miss a field trip. I'm never, I'm gonna volunteer in the classroom. I'm gonna drive to school, pick up at least three times a week. And I could set those rules for myself as, a, as well as others. Um, and then I realized in, in, in my new circumstance, I sort of stopped setting the rules. And all of a sudden, I'm traveling all the time. And uh, my kids are, are sort of left to defend themselves. And, and I was having a conversation with a woman recently. I just pulled my daughter out of school. She's in eighth grade. I was like, well, you know, eighth grade doesn't matter. High school matters. So I pulled her out of, <laughs> out of school and, <laughs> and said, you're going to come with me to DC because I just haven't seen you very much in the last month. So I yanked her out. And I'm feeling really guilty about that. And then I'm talking to another mother. She said, oh, I used to do that all the time. It's a perfect solution. <laughs> And I, and, and I think that's, that's the thing is we, <laughs> we have to go easy on ourselves. We have to step back every once in a while and say, hey, I just spun up a really great world for myself that's killing my kids. And I gotta, I gotta sit back down with them and say, okay, so how do we reconstruct this? How do we do this in a way that's gonna work for all of us? And, um, and so I guess you know, I would just say simply that it's, it really has to be individual. Nobody has the answers. And whatever you're doing to get creative, somebody else is doing it too. I'm sure of it. <laughs> somebody else is pumping in the airport. Or <laughs> they, they, right? We gotta do we, we gotta do what we gotta do to Yeah, I love I love what you said about the rules for yourself because when, when you're the when you're the boss lady, you can do that. But if you're somebody who's coming up in your career, you don't necessarily have the flexibility to set those same rules. Um, I know personally when, when I was coming up the chain, I would find myself, I, I, I talk about this a lot, but every time we had a company celebration and there would be a cake and all the guys would give their speeches and I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then they'd all walk away from the cake and nobody would cut the cake. And I'd like be elbow deep in icing and serving everybody cake because frankly, I wanted cake. Um, <laughs> But I, I realized I was the only one doing that, and I was an executive. And why was I cutting the cake? And I was letting. And I and it wasn't the guys weren't trying to be like, "No, Audrey will serve you." But but it was <laughs> happening that way. So I made a rule that I am not going to cut any more goddamn cake <laughs> at work. Um, and I also have rules like I I could be out every night, as I'm sure you guys could. I only will do four nights a week max including the weekends, and if you ask me for the fifth, I say, I'm sorry, I have, I have to be with my husband or my, my son. Do you all have rules like that that you think other people can adopt, Karen? Thankfully, now both of my children are out of college. Um, so, and I wasn't expecting actually to be at this moment so soon. My daughter actually graduated from Cal in two years. So she Whoa. finished at 19. Yeah. Wow. So, the benefit of a working mom. <laughs> yes. 
So, um, you know, as far as... Is she, is she living with you? Because if you say no, everybody's going to be super jealous. Of so she is now. living with me okay, right good, now. Good, um, Because she's decided to go back to school and do a post-baccalaureate. So my daughter, um, and I don't think I'm directly answering your question, but I think this is a little segue here into a little discussion about um, finding your own path. So my daughter did a full load of, of courses at community college while she was still in high school and competing in two varsity sports, you know, had a very full and active social life, so she wasn't missing out on anything. But she told me that she made a very conscious decision to do this because she ran the numbers. She's an inherent planner by background. Um, so she calculated, OK, if I get a part-time job, um, I'll make x amount of dollars approximately that I can save toward you know, my college expenses. But if I take community college classes now at about $28 a quarter, um, I can save about $70,000 in tuition and living expenses. So I think I'm going to do the latter. Um, so she graduated from Cal in two years at the age of 19. Um, Phi Beta Kappa got one B, her first and ever B in her lifetime. Um, so basically, my daughter makes me look like a slacker. <laughs> Coco, do you have any rules for yourself? Yeah, I, I do have rules for myself, and and um, and and I, I break them, but. Um, <laughs> But one of the rules was I'm only out one night a week. So um, that, that rule got broken, and it got broken for a two-month um, uh, stint. And so I went back, and I, 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 I plotted my calendar for the last year, and I colored in every night I was out and every day I was traveling. And then I counted the times I was gone versus the times I was home. And that was depressing. And so I sat back and said, OK, I've got to do this differently. Because my daughter, I have three kids. My kids are doing that themselves, too. And they're saying, you know, hey, mom, you're not here. We don't, we're not counting the time, but you're not here. Um, and so yeah, that rule is there for me. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a hard and fast rule in that it does make me step back every once in a while and say, OK, so I was supposed to be out one night a week or traveling at most three days in, in any month. That was kind of my rule for myself. How do I now reconstruct what I'm doing so that I can do that? How do I design my team in a way that will allow me to do that? And I'm in the as you know I'm in a leader, leadership position, so I'm the only one who is to blame, right? I can I can do that. I can figure that out for myself. So I I force myself to do that. Um, a, a couple of other little rules I have. Um, I always pick up the phone if it's my kids. So right before this started, I texted my kids and said I will not be able to pick up the phone for the next couple of hours. Right? <laughs> so you know I have little rules like that 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 keep me keep keep me and them connected in a way that. Um, helps us to understand where our priorities are. And my rules tend to be around how I engage my family or stay, stay connected to my family. Any rules, Oriana? Yeah, I would say two big ones. And, and we talked about this during um, our prep session. But I think oftentimes um, working mothers' um, mental health is, is something that we don't talk about. So I do daily check-ins with myself. Like, how am I feeling? Do I feel anxious? Am I stressed? You know, just to kind of regulate on, on how I'm feeling for that day. And if I need a break or I need to go have me time, I do it. Because ultimately, I can't take care of anybody else if I'm not taking care of myself. So I make sure to always have those checks. Um, and my husband's really great about letting me have me time where nobody's screaming like, Mom, or touching me. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, I get to have I get to have alone time, and I I think that's just really important. We we don't talk about that enough, as as women and as working mothers, that we have to take care of ourselves first. Um, and then secondly, I try to be as present as I can when I'm with the kids. So I will put my computer aside. I won't look at text unless it's a, a, a ur urgency or emergency. Something's going on at work. And I really just try to absorb myself in that moment um, because the years are going by so quickly. And they're young now, but they're not going to be young tomorrow. And I want them to remember me being with them in that moment and engaging and playing. So those are my two rules. Yes. The days are long, the years are short. Yes. yes. Uh, at least I know you have something to say about, about yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, 
for me, one of the rules is around, I call it pick six, and that's pick six things that are for my well-being every day. Because I feel like um, if anyone else kind of is usually an overdrive, kind of an overachiever type A, we'll get done what work things need to get done. But the problem is, for me, I can quickly go into that overdrive mode and forget to take care of myself. Like my default is probably not taking care of myself. So I created a game for myself called Pick Six where that'll include meditation or working out. It could even be, you know, on days where I'm really busy, like one of the Pick Six is like, take your vitamins or drink some water. I mean, little baby steps, but actually, um, they can really prioritize my well-being. And the other ways I think about it is, you know, how can I be a role model to my two daughters and really show them what it looks like to take care of yourself? Um, so it's okay to sometimes say, um, you know, mommy needs to go and rest right now or mommy needs to go for a walk by herself to show that that's, that's okay, that's normal. We all have needs and we don't need to be embarrassed about them or ashamed by them. And same with, you know, if we make a mistake, like how do we you know, interact or um, what do we do in those moments? Like a couple months ago, I turned on um, the blender, the top wasn't on, you know how that works. And, <laughs> and uh, there was the chocolate protein smoothie was all <laughs> over the place. And that was a moment where my daughter and I just, I was like, let's just laugh about this. Like, oops, mommy makes mistakes. Like everyone makes mistakes sometimes. And then I was super proud that then my daughter's response after that was, should we go wake up daddy to clean this up? <laughs> and I was like, yes, I'm doing something right. We have, by some measures, 50% or more of middle managers are women. But as you all know, when you get further up the food chain, it goes down to maybe 5% of executives and certainly even fewer of that on boards and in, in the C-suite. So um, one of the issues that's been acknowledged is that doing this upward climb, if you're so inclined to do it, women tend to give up some of their authenticity. Um, and I, I know that's certainly, the skills that get you to middle management are not necessarily the skills that get you beyond middle management. So Karen, what do you think, what were the key things that helped you make that transition from middle management to upward? You have to be willing to advocate for yourself. Don't wait for someone to come to you and tap you on the shoulder and say, are you willing to take on a new challenge or a new role? You have to constantly be advocating for yourself, especially when you're working in a large corporation. Don't assume that leadership knows about all the remarkable achievements that you've been doing um, at that mid-market level, because chances are they don't. Um, you know, I think there was an article about Wells recently where they interviewed, um, you know, some people within our community bank structure and they asked, um, you know, what has your experience been in working within Wells Fargo? And while, you know, they were generally very supportive, one of our ladies mentioned that the first time that she was considered for a managing director position, in another institution, she was actually shocked when she was declined. And when she asked for feedback as to why she didn't get the managing director position, she was told, because no one on the committee knew who you were. So despite the fact that she had been excelling in her job performance, um, just the fact that no one on the committee even knew who she was, you know, she was declined the first go round. The first time that I was considered for a senior vice president position, same thing happened to me. Um, I was told no. And when I asked for feedback, I said, you know, I've had very positive reviews. And again, you know, why is it that I didn't achieve this, um, you know, distinction? I was again told because. Um, people are not aware of who you are. So you need to be very vocal and advocating for yourself. And interestingly enough, ladies, that's one thing that our male counterparts don't hesitate to do. Um, they tend to brag about their achievements and they're very vocal about it. Women, we tend to just assume that people are aware and that we don't need to raise anyone's you know, level of attention. So be very vocal. Don't yeah. hesitate Sometimes to advocate. Sometimes that, that um that tactic gets you elected president, even. <laughs> the, um, the, 
you know, I, I think that's really interesting. I think there are two two different sides. There's there's the women who just think I will work hard and and work my way up. For me, it was sort of the opposite. Like to to exist as a reporter, talking to the cops, talking to you have to be a little bit more. Um, you know, you, you swear more, and you and you're a little more aggressive, and those are skills that once I got let into the all male boardroom, they were like, "What is up with this woman?" And and they actually hired an executive coach for me, which I didn't even know existed. I did not know you existed, Lisa, or I would have called you. But it was so interesting to figure out what that transition was like for me, Oriana. What was that? If you could go back and tell young, younger, because you you are young, uh, younger Oriana. <laughs> That what young. that transition would be like, what would you say? Um, yeah, I mean, I think just building on what Karen said, advocate for yourself, but also find those brand ambassadors. Because I think that, especially being a woman of color, for me, finding those advocates in the workplace, so it's, it's a dual... Um, at advocate, right? So you're advocating for yourself, but you need others to be in your corner. Your network is everything. Your your network is your brand. So finding those people who are ultimately going to help you along the way, who are committed to your success, who want to see you succeed. I think oftentimes we as women don't help each other enough. And I'm lucky to have a lot of women mentors and advocates, but I've sought them out. I've made the effort. I've asked people to coffee or lunch or just to connect. I think we have to put ourselves out there to formalize those connections. So you are your best advocate, but your network is your brand as well. Lisa, what do you have to? What you now? You do this. You you are helping yeah. people like me. What do you you say? Audrey, stop swearing so much in board <laughs> meetings. Or so I think you know authenticity is really important and showing up the way that feels good for you. I think. Burnout is closely tied to those situations where we feel like we have to be someone else. Um, then we can just get exhausted. But I think there's kind of um, two levels to burnout. And one thing that I coach my clients on is around um, what's going on up here and like working on quieting your inner critic, kind of managing that self-doubt because that takes a toll on our energy in ways um, that we don't really see. And it can be so important to just honestly get out of our own way. Sometimes we're, the things we're telling to ourselves, I, come, I tell my clients, like, imagine your inner critic as someone else. If they were a friend in your life, you would have ditched that friend years ago. You wouldn't put up with someone in your life that said the kind of things that you say to yourself all the time. And then we wonder like, why we're feeling like nervous when we're on stage or we're feeling like we can't go and ask for the raise. It's like, well, because we're sitting there just saying all this negative stuff to ourselves. So I think but, kind of keeping you, that in check. How do you do that? I mean, I can't turn off my, I'm already self-critical of the fact that I told you all I cuss too much. So yeah. like, how, how, do you, how do you do that? Yeah, so I mean, one really helpful tool is around meditation, which you know, lots of high performers take time to meditate. I can tell you for me and my journey, it's been transformative and helping, but when I first sat down to meditate, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm sitting around doing nothing. This is the biggest waste of time. <laughs> I mean, I was very much, and I said to myself, okay, I'm gonna do this every day because I've read the research, the research said it's gonna work. And I said, okay, I should do five minutes a day. I'm like, mm-mm, too much. I'm gonna start with four minutes, four minutes a day. I mean, it started that small, and over time, it built a really big change into my life. So um, I have you know, a 30-day meditation challenge on my website where you can meditate for just five minutes a day, do a guided meditation. I found that that, honestly, um, it is hard to do, but it makes the biggest difference. Great. <laughs> well, what I, what I would contribute is, so the women don't advance for a couple of reasons. One is self-inflicted and one is not. Um, the self-inflicted is that we opt out and the other side is that we aren't, we aren't seen for our, our value. So on the self-inflicted piece, I would say don't um, shy away from asking for what you absolutely need. So example, a woman who is um, promoted to one of the top, you know, probably the top 40 women in Microsoft, was having a conversation with her. She was, at, she was given that promotion three times before she said yes. And the first two times she, said, she kept saying, no, 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 I'm great here, I you know, don't want to move. 
And finally, the third time, her leader said to her, I'm not going to ask you again. Do you want this promotion? And she said, well, here's the thing. My son has this disability, and da 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 and I've got this great school. And he's like, I can solve that problem for you. <laughs> so that would be the opt-out one. And they did solve that problem for her, and it was fantastic. Um, the ask for what you need piece is, you know, I was promoted at 27 years old to vice president of an organization I had no business running two-thirds of, of 750 people. I'd never even been a director at that point. But I was promoted because the guy who was brought in before me failed within two weeks. And they turned to me and said, you can do this, you know, and gave me the job. And I said, OK, I can do it. <laughs> and six months into the job, I came back to my CEO and I said, hey, I'm pretty sure you didn't, you're not paying me what you were paying him. I have no idea what you were paying him, but I know he came with a really big background and all this you know, worthiness of why he should be paid this amazing salary. All I'm going to say to you is, if I deserve the job, and I'm doing the job, and I'm doing it better, or at least as good as he is, and, oh, you're doing way better, then pay me what I'm worth. And I left it at that, and he came back, and he gave me the most outrageous salary bump I'd ever had in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> so I would just say, ask for it. We, we were joking before this that I, I've heard it said that um, when the guys in the top position fail, that's when the rest of the board is like, well, maybe we should have a woman in charge. <laughs> I, 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 I love that story. All right, we're, we're, we have five minutes left, and I want to make sure everybody can go home with like at least one thing that you're going to try out. So is, if there's one thing that you think every woman could learn from that you failed at, what would it be? So Lisa, we'll start with you on the end. One thing that I failed at, um, well, I think, I, I would say take it easy on yourself, you know, especially new moms out there. It is a big life adjustment. I think as society, um, we just try to push forward and, it, you know, if you get thrown back into the mix. So I'd say take it easy on yourself and, you know, choose you and then the benefits will, will flow out from there. I think I'm still working on this, to be totally honest. Um, so for me, and I don't know if this innately comes um, to women, I have this natural inclination. Like, I want to be liked. And I think as we rise the ladder and go up the totem pole, um, you realize that, that like and respect, there is a line, right? And so you can be respected without being liked, and you can be liked without being respected. So I think finding that middle ground, for me, as I rise to a leadership position, is really important. How do you assess that yourself? I, I think it's just an intuitive thing, and I think it's different for each of us, but I actually attended this um, global travel summit in Hawaii. I was in Oahu Monday through Wednesday. Don't hate me for work. <laughs> um, and this uh, presenter, this keynote presenter came out, and he was talking about a grid of likability and authority and competence, and it was really interesting to see how people are broken down on this grid and how you can attain that top right quadrant. Um, and so I think it's just a work in progress for each of us as we find our own leadership style. And it's something that I'm still working on. But I think, to your point, Lisa, just being easy on yourself and realizing that we're each trying every day to figure out our way as individuals. I, I think that's such a good point. Because the thing that I would tell young me is, I think most people are faking it most of the time, or at least part of the time. Yes. And that's like, we don't. You don't want to say that because then everybody thinks you're a faker, but right. you kind of you have to fake it till you make it yeah. a little bit. Yeah. I love that. And I think also as moms, too, right? Like you oh, realize I'm as you become a mom, that. you're like, <laughs> you're like, my parents didn't know what the hell they were doing. But you don't realize that until you're there. Yeah. So I think you have these moments of epiphany along the way, and then you realize more of the camaraderie that you have together. So Coco, you're putting women on boards, now hopefully even more with legislation. We'll see if it stands up in court. Right. So what is, what is the thing that you tell them or what you could have told yourself that, that you learned the hard way? Ah, okay, well, so the women, so, okay, so it, looking at it from that perspective, I would actually answer this question differently than I was going to, which is, so what I would say to women, if you're, you got to think about it this way, when your kid is trying to get into college, right, they do all the right things in, in high school. They take the AP classes, they get the great grades, they're, 
You know, they're, they're kind of going through the motions of like, check that box, check that box, check that box. I've got all of the credentials. When it comes down to it, you can have the, you know, the 4.5 GPA, which I didn't realize really existed, but it does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you can have the GPA, um, but, it, but nowadays everybody's competing at that sort of super high level, right? And which is craziness in and of itself. But everybody's competing at that level. It comes down to the story they can tell about themselves. It comes down to that essay and how they're going to tell the story of who they are, backed up by the things they do. It's the same thing in executive leadership. Once you get into senior ranks of leadership, it's all about how you can tell the story of, of how you are an overarching steward of the company, why you are, are a great choice for leading long-term value, purpose, culture for the corporation overarching. So I would just say, lesson learned for me, stop talking about the things you've done, the, the, how you created this ladder, and start thinking about the who you are and how that brings a, you know, a unique contribution overarching to, to your company and to your career and your people, your family, all of it. Awesome. Karen, last word. I would just echo Coco's comments. I think she summed it up very, very well. Um, be able to tell your story. Um, as I mentioned previously, be able to advocate for yourself. I think that that is one thing that um, you know, and it's interesting because being a lawyer by background, usually we don't have trouble advocating for ourselves. <laughs> um, but you get into a corporate environment and you assume that people are aware of who you are and the accomplishments that you have made. And, and that is not always the case. So that way would be my advice. Awesome. All right. So don't worry about cussing. Be your authentic self. Advocate for yourself. <laughs> ask for that raise. Sorry for all the bosses that brought your employees because they're all going to go back and ask for raises. And thank you, ladies. You are really, truly inspiring. And I've learned a lot from you today. I appreciate it.